Okay, we want to talk about um, decision making from a biblical standpoint. There's a lot of stuff we need to talk about here. And uh, wow, I hope we have enough time in the hour, the couple hours that we have in order to deal with this. Let's bow for prayer. Gracious Father, we are thankful for this opportunity again today to be able to go back to the Word of God and seek answers to the serious issues of life. We know that we'll face a lot of people with a lot of decisions that need to be made and, um, and we'll discover that they don't make those decisions biblically. Um, and we will need to be ready and well prepared in order to how, instruct them on how to make the proper kind of decisions. So help us during our time today to focus in on this and to think clearly about it. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, we want to work on Christian decision making. And this is such a critical issue because there is a plethora of uh, counseling issues that you're going to encounter that will involve people either making the correct kind of decisions uh, that are uh, made with biblical criteria in mind, or they're going to make errant decisions that will only cause more problems later on for their life. And, of course, our desire is, hopefully, that they're going to make the right kind of decisions. That's our desire. That's what we want um, to happen. So let's take a look at this and examine this from a biblical perspective, if we can. Some Christians today are facing extremely difficult or agonizing decisions that will uh, seek your help to make sure that they're making the best possible decisions. Um, in some cases, um, oh, well, I'm going to give you several examples of what can actually be going on there, um, or some examples of those terrible decisions. Um, there are also many who will come to counseling with a dif different presentation problem, but ultimately you'll find yourself helping them through a biblical decision-making model. Um, they may come with a presentation problem, I'm struggling with depression. And you discover that the, one of the reasons why they're struggling with depression is because they have a whole history of making poor decisions that has led them into a miserable life. Um, or they may come um, and talk about, we're here in order to, um, we need help in terms of solving our marital problems. That's their presentation problem. When, as you gather data from them and you begin to do an inventory of their lives and what's going on in their marriage, you realize that they too have a history of making very, very poor decisions. Um, they really weren't mindful of good biblical criteria in making those decisions. Or somewhere along the line, they were taught the wrong emphasis in terms of that biblical material. Um, maybe they appealed to the Bible, but they appealed to wrong sections of the Bible or had wrong theology about what the Bible taught in terms of making those decisions. We can give you an example of several of them. For instance, some of the more simple decisions that you run into in counseling, uh, people want to know, uh, who should I marry? Um, uh, that's, uh, really, that's not a complicated decision in terms of setting out the criteria. In fact, J. Adams has a whole section uh, there in his book um, on um, the Christian Counselor's Manual as well as a theology of Christian counseling. In both books, he has a whole section on, on good decision making and how to, make, uh, how to help your counselees make good decisions. Um, who should I marry? Um, should I marry to begin with? Who should I marry? Is the second question. Should I go into full-time Christian service? Um, is that what God would, is that God's calling upon my life? And how do I make that particular decision? Uh, should I be a missionary? Um, maybe in a cross-cultural context, is that what God would have me to do? Um, how much should I tithe? How much should I give to the Lord in reality? Is 10% adequate? Is that what I should do in terms of my giving to the Lord? Uh, is it 15%? Is it 20%? Is it 25%? Um, what is it? What, what should I give? Uh, how, how do I express my love for the Lord through my giving? 
Um, is it right for me to change churches? Um, am I using the right kind of criteria if I believe that maybe my church is um, not giving me the proper kind of teaching? Or maybe my church has an errant view of the gospel? Or maybe my church doesn't practice church discipline? Or maybe my church is a part of a denomination, even though my church is, does not endorse this, but they're a part of a denomination that has, agrees with women being pastors. Should I change churches as a result of that? Um, um, those are some, uh, some questions that will come up. Uh, would it be good for me to quit my job? Um, and by what criteria should I use to do that and possibly even seek another job? How do I do that? Um, oftentimes people will come to you as a pastor or as a counselor and seek uh, answers to those questions. And then you're going to run into much more difficult questions um, in terms of Christian decision making. For example, is it right for me to separate from my spouse for the children's safety? Is that okay? If I, if I, um, I know that the Bible it frowns on divorce, and um, yeah, if I want to keep my marriage together because I believe that's honoring uh, to God, is it right for me uh, to protect my children and separate from my spouse if I believe that there's a potential my spouse could abuse me or my children? This becomes a little bit more difficult in terms of decision making. What if you're a pastor and you discover your teenager is denied the faith? What do I do? When my teenager is denied the faith, what do I believe about Titus chapter 1 where it talks about you're supposed to have children who believe? How do I deal with that word pistuo or pistis, uh, faith, the Greek term pistis or pistuo, how do, I, how do I understand that word, children who believe? Do they have to believe the gospel? Do they have to believe me? Um, do they have to be uh, trustworthy? Was that way I could take that word? They need to be trustworthy children? Um, that becomes a little bit more difficult in handling the issue. Um, should we use fertility treatments in order to have a baby? Is that okay for us as a couple? Well, a lot of this... Um, probably depends on what's going to be used and how it's going to be used and um, whether or not uh, any kind of artificial insemination is going to result in, a, in fertilized eggs that are going to be destroyed, which is equivalent to destroying children. Um, or there are a lot of issues that come in on this, uh, complicated issues that have been brought about as a result of modern technology today. Uh, which way do I go on this issue? Or could have the issue, what do you do if you have an illegal immigrant as a member of your church? Maybe your particular law, uh, your country's law says um, you've got to report an illegal immigrant and this particular person is a member of your church. Um, what am I going to do there? Uh, this is pretty complicated. It gets complicated. Maybe the answer is more clear to some people than others, but... Um, the, this, this makes it difficult because there's a human element to it, obviously, and personal relationships that are involved here. And um, so, uh, so, and we could go on and on and on and list lots of different issues that could come up. I just throw these out as possibilities to help kind of prime the pump on how important this whole area is in biblical decision making. What's involved in this? Well, you can see the issue laid out for us. Well, let's take a look at the importance of this here. First of all, we need to understand the topic is a critical topic from the standpoint of Scripture. Very important. God's will is directly related to moral decisions. We know that. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 3. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. That is, you abstain from sexual immorality. That's the will of God. Um... So this has to do with moral decisions, very specific moral decisions in life. Um, am I going to be immoral um, in my judgments or not? So um, that's, that has to do with moral decision makings. And God's will is directly related to difficult decisions as well. 
Uh, for example, you get into 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 through 15, that says, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority, or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God that by doing right you might silence, might silence the ignorance of foolish men. Now, in and of itself, that's pretty straightforward. But if you understand the context in which 1 Peter was written, it's the kind of a context where the Christians were undergoing severe persecution. These are, this is probably the early days of the Nerodian persecution, and they're under heavy um, uh, stress at that particular time. And uh, the governmental leaders of Rome were falsely accusing Christians of... Um, Later on, Nero does this in terms of uh, the fact that it was Christians who set the, the fire that helped to burn most of Rome, when in reality it wasn't the Christians who did it at all. It was Nero who did it in order to clear out the slum area so that he could build more of his palaces and temples. Um, so uh, Christians were being falsely accused. Well, in the midst of this literal tinderbox of, of persecution, um, Peter says, submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every human institution. I would imagine that was hard to read by those early Christians. Oh, uh, this is not what I wanted to hear, I could see some of them saying. Um, you know, I mean, these people are being immoral. They're being ungodly. They're, I mean, they're falsely accusing us um, of things that are not true in our lives. Um, but he says, no, you need to submit yourself to this human institution, uh, whether to um, a king as with the one in authority or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right, right. In other words, there's no authority, as Romans 13 says, there's no authority that's there that hasn't been appointed by God. Um, so this has to do with God's will is directly related to moral decisions and it's directly related to the difficult decisions of life. And, and that carry a lot of um, heavy consequences as a result of this. So this is really critical. Well, in addition to this, uh, the topic to our daily decisions in life is an important topic. Because God's will is directly related to your moral decisions. Uh, decisions... Uh, that deal with lying, cheating, stealing, immorality, adultery, sinful divorce, cursing, murder, rape, abortion, abuse, deceit, etc. And we could go on and on and on and on. Um, it's how you make decisions on how you're going to run your life. And how you're going to be a good steward of the, the health and the energy and the abilities that God has provided you. The, your eyesight, your, your bodily abilities, um, uh, your hearing, your taste, your feeling, all of these things given to you by God, how are you going to use them? Um, uh, this, all of this has mo heavy moral overtones for the Christian. Um, furthermore, God's will is directly related to your difficult decisions. Uh, when to be submissive and when to disobey human authority. Uh, like Peter in front of the Sanhedrin, when the Sanhedrin said to him, uh, Peter and John said to them, we want you to stop preaching in the name of Christ. And um, th this was a dilemma because the Bible is very clear about the fact that they had a responsibility to obey governmental leaders. But Peter was the one who wrote, submit yourself, we just saw there in 1 Peter 2, uh, to every human authority. Um, yet, Peter disobeyed the Sanhedrin. Why? Because the Sanhedrin at that particular point was basically giving a rule, uh, giving them a law, which directly contradicted something that God had told them to do. God had told them to go and preach in the name of Christ. So the obvious answer was Peter's response, shall we obey God or man? And in this particular case, then God's um, being submissive to God overrules being submissive to man. And any time any government would require Christian to do something that would be clearly morally wrong by biblical standards, then that Christian has a biblical responsibility to resist that government, to disobey what the government says. 
Um, or, or there's discerning sovereign possibilities as God's opportunities. How do we do that? You know, sometimes in decision making, this is what we call open doors. Because God has opened this door, does that necessarily mean that we should walk through it? Because open doors lead to elevator shafts, right? Um, not all open doors mean that that's God's moral will for our life. Because a church calls you doesn't mean you ought to go there. Doesn't mean that. Um, because um, someone is willing to marry you doesn't mean you ought to marry that person. Okay? Um, so how do you view, how do you discern sovereign possibilities as God's opportunities in your life? How do you discern that? How do, you, how do you ferret that issue out? All that has to do with decision making. Um, or understanding the difference between wisdom and foolishness in your decision making. Well, some things are obviously very clearly right and wrong. Black and white. Uh, true or untrue. Uh, evil and wicked. Or uh, righteous and pure. Uh, how do you tell it? But there are a lot of things that happen in life where it's not that clear. Um, and decisions you have to make. Well, you know, this could go either way. So then the question comes, well, it's not right or wrong, but what is really wise and what's foolish? All right, it's, it's not a clear moral issue. What is wise and, and, and what is foolish? Um, that, that's the issue. Uh, when the masters called me to come and teach here uh, and I was in the pastorate I, I love the pastor I love shepherding I could have very easily just stayed there and been as happy as can be um, and I think I could have turned down the offer to come and teach and it would have been a um, a morally neutral issue um, basically I could have stayed and continued to pastor in that church and that wouldn't have been a sinful thing for me at all so it wasn't an issue of right and wrong to go and teach a master's. The issue for me, what was the wisest thing to do? And one of the critical issues in making that decision was the fact that, all right, when it comes to biblical counseling, that's what they were calling me to do. Um, I had taught our church biblical counseling. It was a part of the very fabric of the church. It's something that's still going on today. There's a lot of counseling training that's going on today. And if I have an opportunity to influence uh, churches nationally and internationally, it would seem that that would be the wiser decision with my life. So that that became a critical issue. Yes. How do you uh, balance that with the? And I'm not presuming on you and Eric. No, 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 I understand. How do you balance that with saying I'm not going to be prideful that hey I'm going to have? You understand that? Right. Account? Exactly. Um, I think that you have to survey your own heart and make sure it's not a pride issue. That you're, um, you're making that decision on the basis of that. Um, uh, it could have easily been switched the other way around. Because from this perspective, you could say it's a pride issue. But if I, if I would have stayed there in that ministry, I could have been a pride issue too. Because I had helped to found, found the church. I could have could, continued on. And, and, you know, and continued with the church still growing and, you know, and look, I've been here for how many years? <sighs> look at me type of thing. That could have easily been on the other shoe. Um, uh, so I think that those issues have to be weighed out on a motive level in the heart. Um, but um, I think you see the, what I'm trying to illustrate here. And that is... There are a lot of decisions that Christians make that are not, don't, do not fall clearly into right and wrong categories. Then, if that's the case, if this is not a right and wrong thing, then, then it's got to be a wisdom and foolishness thing. What's the wisest thing I can do? And then, what's the foolish thing I, I could end up doing here? As best as I understand things now. So, this is where God's will is directly related. You can see here, it's directly related uh, to your difficult decisions. Um, uh, both of those are involved. Okay. Well, we've got, to, in order, we've got to define our terms here briefly if we're really going to make 
uh, headway in understanding good biblical decision making. And the first term that comes up here is really a theological term, is what we call God's decretive will. All right? And this is basically built upon the word that means God's decree, what he has decreed to happen in all the ages. Now I want you to take your Bible just for a moment and take a look at this because I think this is critical. Go over to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. Um, <clears throat> in verse 1, it says, God, after he spoke long ago to the prophets in um, or to the fathers in the prophets in many portions and in many ways. Verse 2. In these last days has spoken to us in his son. Whom he appointed heir of all things. Through whom also he made the world. That's the way a New American Standard translates it. The word for world there is not the word cosmos. It's not the word erge either. Or that means earth. But it is the word ionos, which more often than not is translated ages. Um, so um, God didn't just create this physical domain. What, what he's saying here, the author of Hebrews is saying, God created all of history. He created all the ages. He made it all. Everything that's going, to be un, that's going to unfold here is what God created. He created the Ionos. That's God's decree. That's his decretive will. He created the Ionos, the ages. All that has happened, all that is happening, all that will happen to come, past, present, present, future, is what God has created. So in dealing with this, what we're really working with is God's sovereignty. God's sovereignty. You understand that from theology class. Um, his absolute right to do all things according to his own good pleasure. That is his sovereignty. God's sovereignty. His absolute right to do all things according to his own good pleasure. And he is the very definition of that which is good. God alone is the creator and sustainer of all that is. God is the sovereign Lord who designed the standards for life and directs all things towards their appointed destiny. God alone is wise enough, righteous enough, loving enough to determine what shall become of his creation. God does what he wills. That is the absolute, unquestioned, undetermined sovereignty of God. There is nothing that limits his sovereignty other than his own character himself. Or the, his own aspects of his own character. There's nothing outside of God that limits his character. We're talking about the sovereign workings of God in our life. So as you work with people and as you counsel with them, this becomes a critical issue to define for them. What are we talking about? And how do they understand the sovereignty of God? If you get a Christian who is coming more out of an Arminian type of a background, that basically believes more in the absolute undetermined free will of man, then you're, they're going to have a problem with the sovereignty of God. They're going to struggle with this area, with God being sovereign. And there are several instances of this where we could highlight God's sovereignty. Um, um, if you have your Bible there, let's go over just to a couple of instances. Let's go back to the um, the, book, the Old Testament to the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and here we get an insight into the sovereignty of God um, verse 1 says there is an appointed time for everything who makes that appointment? well God does uh, we'll see this down in verse 14 later on and there is a time for every event under heaven 
a time to give birth, a time to die, a time to plant, time to uproot, time to kill, time to heal, time to tear down, time to build up, time to weep, time to laugh, time to mourn, time to dance, time to throw stones, time to gather stones, time to embrace, time to shun embracing, time to search, time to give up as lost, time to keep, time to throw away, time to tear apart, time to sew together, time to be silent, time to speak, a time to love, a time to hate, a time for war, a time for peace. Now, Almost all the times where you hear this particular passage mentioned, you hear it from a standpoint of human timeliness. So we've got to be timely in what we do as human beings. But that's not what this is saying at all. In fact, that violates the whole contextual flow of the text. It doesn't have anything to do with human timeliness. It has everything to do with God's sovereignty. In other words, it's God who brings these things about. You mean he's the one who gives birth? Yes. He's the one who appoints a time to die, yes. He's the one who plants, yes. He's the one who uproots, yes. He's the one who kills, yes. He's the one who heals, yes. And there's so much more that we could say about that. All right? That's the absolute sovereignty of God. Now, why does God do all that? Why does God want us to understand that? We skip down to verse 14, same chapter. He says, I know that everything that God does... There's the emphasis on what God does in terms of his sovereignty. Will remain forever. There is nothing to add to it. And there is nothing to take from it. For God is so worked. So that men should what? Fear him. Right? That's the reason why he is so worked. So that men will fear him. That's what God wants. That's what God's after. God is so worked. So that men will ultimately fear him. That's the reason why he brings about these circumstances in life. All right, and then if you go uh, over to chapter 7 and verse 14, he says, um, in the Ecclesiastes seven fourteen, in the day of prosperity, be happy, but in the day of adversity, consider God has made the one as well as the other. God has made the one as well as the other. That's the absolute sovereignty of God. Um, so God alone is the creator and sustainer of all that is. He is the sovereign God who has set all of these standards. His absolute sovereignty. You can't talk about biblical decision making without the sovereignty of God becoming a predominant issue in your discussion. Um, and this is so vital, so very, very critical. All right. Well, then, what is the second aspect of God's decretive will? And that is the providence of God. What is that? Literally means foresight. But it's generally used to denote God's preserving and governing all things by means of second causes. Or what we would call secondary causes. All right? God has ordained all that is going to be. He's ordained that. He created the Ionos. He made it all. all right? But... When we refer to God's providence or foresight, we're in a sense using a very figurative terminology that's um, an, uh, similar to anth uh, anthropological view of things um, to speak of the fact that he is in the process of preserving all things, governing all things to their appointed ends. That's it. And he may use secondary causes in his providence. Like human events and human people. You know, it, this is one of the things um, in uh, uh, Dr. Wong uh, in the Bible department at the college was talking about today in chapel when he talks about uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.17 about pray without ceasing. Why should we pray when God has sovereignly appointed all things in all the ages? Um, uh, why are we going through the process of going through this laborious effort of prayer when this, this is already the case? Well, the answer to this particular issue is the fact that God has not appointed just the ends of what was going to happen, but he is also appointed by his sovereignty, the means, and that means may be through our prayers. So God is sovereign not only in the ends of what's going to happen, he's sovereign in the process by which it happens. And if he wants us to pray, then our prayers may be the conduit by which these things happen. That's secondary causes. So God in his sovereign, because we pray doesn't mean that somehow God is not sovereign and we can actually change God. God doesn't change, he's immutable. It's we're the ones who change. It's just that God in his sovereignty and decreative will has decreed all things to come to pass. And that's an established fact. 
Um, it's just that he has created the means as well as the ends. Um, this is the teleological aspect of ethical decision making. What are the means and what is God's sovereign imprint upon those means? Providence emphasizes a divine order, ordering and regulation of the world and history towards a positive goal. Predestination emphasizes a divine predetermination of human destiny in conformity with an eternal plan. So you got providence and predestination. God foreordains according to his design and purpose. He chooses and elects according to his counsel and his will. That's what God does. That's part of the providence of God. All right. So we could say this, the creative will of God involves his absolute sovereignty and within that absolute sovereignty is his ongoing providence ensuring in space and time context that all things are working out towards a predetermined end, which is a positive ends. That's the providence of God. So in Christian decision making, this is really key. And there is a sense in which for a lot of people, you end up doing a theological lesson on God's sovereignty and his providence. What is the decretive will of God? What is it? What has he decreed? What does the Bible talk about when it comes to the decretive will of God? Well, there's a good illustration here, right here on the, in Genesis chapter 50 and verse 20. You know, this is the, where God even takes all of evil and brings it around ultimately for good. This is what Joseph said to his brothers. You intended all this for evil, but God intended it for good, the saving of many souls. In other words, they intended to kill Joseph, but God intended to actually use this in order to save them um, later on. And Joseph was able to look on this and say, all of this that you intended evil, God is big enough to turn around for the ultimate good. Uh, that's, that's a great perspective. And that's what we've got to view in terms of the providence of God. God's providence is always bringing these horrible things that happen in human history. Uh, tsunamis, earthquakes, fires, floods, volcanoes erupting, um, uh, cities falling into the sea. Um, all these horrible things that occur. Ultimately, God is big enough to take the horrible events of evil and turn them around for ultimate good. That is the, the, that is the providence of God at work. And the same thing is true with the individual occasions of your counselees' lives as well. God is able to take this and turn those individual evil events that occur in their life and bring it around for good. This is where Jerry Bridges' book, Trusting God Even When Life Hurts, is so good. Because he illustrates that very well on a personal level. In terms of his own struggle with his wife dying of cancer. And at the same time, him struggling with the sovereignty of God in these issues. Um, that's a, oftentimes I'll recommend that book in counseling. Trusting God Even When Life Hurts. There's the preceptive will of God. Now what are we dealing with here? When we're dealing with the preceptive will of God, we're not dealing with mysticism. This is God's moral revealed will. That's what we're dealing with here. Not mysticism. Um, it is the revealed will of God in the 66 canonical books of the Bible and not holy hunches, subjective feelings, mystical experiences, or goosebump leadings. All right? Oh, I just got some. You've been around Christians that like that, that make decisions on the basis of goosebumps or holy hunches. Or, and then they say, oh, it must be the spirit at work in me. And that's the way they make this decision. Well, it's not the spirit. It may be that pepperoni pizza they had the night before. But it's not the spirit that's really working. Um, that's, that's mysticism. God does not want us to put our thinking aside and go on the basis of subjective feelings and experiences in order to make decisions. He wants us to make decisions based upon biblical principles. Uh, what is not directly addressed in scripture concerning a specific decision is covered by broader theological principles. Those principles should guide our decision making process 
so that we keep all of our decisions in line with the standard of his word. And then as we talked about earlier, then there are issues of wisdom. Uh, what is not covered in clear right and wrong categories in scripture then can be made more uh, uh, can be made through biblical discernment and prudence. So that is making decisions based upon wisdom. This is God's preceptive will. All of this has to do with how well you understand the moral revealed will of God. Those 66 canonical books of the scriptures. How well do you understand them? How well do you use them in your decision making process? None of us does it perfectly. But the better you understand the word of God, the better your decisions are going to be made in relationship to the word of God in, in terms of making godly decisions. Now all of these things that we're talking about in terms of God's decretive will and God's perceptive will have a direct implication on how people make decisions or they view decision making process. I think a lot of Christians believe there is like um, the decision making the will of God is more like a, a, um, a target that has concentric circles. And there is the very perfect will of God, uh, use, misusing the Romans 12, 1 and 2. The perfect will of God, which is the very center of the will of God. There's the not so perfect will of God, which is a little bit wider than that. And a little bit wider than that, you get less and less perfect will of God. And you go out and I want to hit the right center of the will of God, people think. All right. Well, that's not the way it works. That's not the way that good biblical theology pictures what's going on. If I were to give you a chart, it would be something like this. This would help you to understand the relationship between the aspects of God's will. His decretive will and his perceptive will. His decretive will can be represented by this large circle here that's kind of greenish yellow. And... Um, uh, God's perceptive will is represented by this circle that's more of a light blue. And you can see the way in which um, these circles overlap. Um, if you were to define them, the overlap is anything that's done that is within the perceptive moral will of God and is part of God's decretive will. That's area number one. That's in a sense... That's not necessarily the idea of a, a target with concentric circles, but it's more or less that's where the moral will of God overlaps with the decretive will of God. Okay? But we realize in our sin-cursed world, there's more than just that which is pure and right that occurs. Area number two are basically the actions or the events that are outside of God's perceptive moral will that do come to pass. It's all of this area here that's outside. These are, this is where all the evil occurs and yet that evil is still a part of God's de decretive will. Uh, how do we know that to be true? Well, take your Bible just for a moment. Let's go over to, uh, let's use the Acts 2 passage, for example. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 23, and then we can also jump over to Acts chapter 4 and use that as well. But um, here, Peter is talking on the day of Pentecost to the Jews that are gathered from all over the world there in Jerusalem. And he, Acts chapter 2, verse 23 says, speaking of Jesus, this man delivered up by the predetermined plan and former knowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. Now on the one hand, first part of the verse, he talks about the predetermined plan of God. And on the other hand, you've got godless, evil men who put him to death. In other words, he's saying that the evil, godless hands of men were all a part of God's predetermined plan and foreknowledge. This is part of God's plan all along. It's part of God's decretive will. Um, 
uh, there is nothing that occurs that's outside of God's sovereign plan. This, the area out here outside of our circle is, does not occur. There's nothing that occurs that, that's outside of this circle, which we label as number two here, God's decretive will. Nothing occurs outside of that. Um, because God has not ordained it. So the greatest crime in all of history was the death of Jesus Christ. Putting the most innocent, pure, holy man of all, falsely accusing him, judging him, and putting him to death. All of that was a part of the divine plan of God. Go over to Acts chapter 4. And um, look at verse 27. Here's the prayer of the early Christians. Uh, where they say, For truly in this city... They were gathered together against thy holy servant Jesus, whom thou didst anoint, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever thy hand and thy purpose predestined to occur. So the greatest crime in all of history, the greatest evil that have occurred in all of history, was a part of, verse 28 says, God's purpose and predestination. Wow. Wow. Can God then take the greatest crime in all of history and turn it around for the good? I hope so, because that means your salvation. Here's the key. Well, then circle number three and then number four. <clears throat> both three and four <clears throat> are the possible events <clears throat> in the past or the future which will not come to pass. God's possible, I mean, possible events in the past and the future, that will not come to pass. And a good example of that probably is Matthew chapter 11, verses 21 through 24. Um, here, in this particular case, Jesus is speaking. <clears throat> woe to you, uh, uh, Chorazon, woe to you, Bethsaida, for if the miracles had occurred in Tyre and Sidon, uh, Sidon which occurred in you, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Now, that's not what happened. But what Jesus is basically saying is, if this could have happened, you would have repented. Those are all the possible things that are in the past or the future which will not come to pass. But they were hypothetically conceivable. Okay. Um, and that is realm three and four. But all of that occurred outside of God's decretive will. Uh, or didn't actually occur. Could have occurred outside of God's creative, uh, decretive will. But it didn't. And it's not even possible. Uh, or it's not, um, it's not going to happen because God hasn't ordained it. Of course, and what we're after here, then ultimately, is in terms of decision making... Uh, lining up perfectly with what God has decreed in terms of his sovereignty and his moral will. That's what we're really after in the whole decision-making process. So if we were to describe that, then as long as you are within, if your decision that you're making is within God's preceptive will, then it's also according to God's decretive will. Um... You can choose, you have the freedom now to choose what is, whatever you like. If you have more than one option here in this area, you can choose any of them, and that's still part of God's perceptive will. You know, if you want to marry Sue or Bethany, and they both love the Lord, and you could, both, you could serve the Lord with either of those girls uh, the rest of your life, then it's up to you. Which one do you like the best? All right? Uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, both lines up with the moral will of God. Uh, uh, it's up to you to make that particular decision. Um, and you're not acting outside of God's moral will at that particular point. Now, the problem is here is that w in this whole issue, is in, before we make this decision, we really want to know what the future is. That's the problem. Uh, a lot of your counselees want to know, well, you know, I just, 
there, there are some things I want God to reveal to me, to tell me what I need to do because I just don't know what's going to happen in the future. Well, when, when your counseling gets demanding like that, that becomes a Deuteronomy 29, 29 issue. If you want to grab your Bible, go back there. <clears throat> then they've really tread into God's territory. Deuteronomy 29, 29. Where Moses writes and he says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our sons forever that we may observe all the words of this law. In other words, what... Moses is saying here is that we have been given the, the Bible, the revealed will of God. That belongs to us. He hasn't given us what's going to happen in detail in the future. He hasn't told us what's a part of his decretive will in the future. So for us to sit here and long for it or want to know it or ask for some kind of supernatural revelation from God so that we can know it is really treading on God's turf, God's territory. That's stuff that doesn't belong to us. He has given us everything we need. So all the subjective experiences and trying to make decisions for the future that's based upon God revealing some kind of special insight into the future is wrong. It's treading on God's territory. And that's not what we should do as his people. Um, that's when we begin to violate uh, Deuteronomy 29.29. Um, don't let your counselees get to that point where they're trying to, uh, wanting God to reveal things that haven't been revealed, that are not a part. The perceptive will of God, as you can see up here, this blue area, this is what belongs to us. That's what belongs to us. And to our children, uh, um, until Christ returns, until that happens, whatever happens in the future in terms of his sovereign will, only God knows. And his sovereign will only becomes apparent as each moment we step into the future. <laughs> That's how his sovereign will becomes apparent. All right. At this particular point, we're going to take a break, but let me ask for questions before we do. So far, yes. Maybe this, I don't know if this falls into one of these two categories or it's kind of a separate thing. Then, then what do you do with like God's, because uh, I thought it was a part of his perceptive will. I thought I'd say that, but maybe not. God's desirous will where God desires things to happen that may or may not happen. I mean, obviously, he ultimately knows. Yes. But like, you know, in 1 Timothy 2, you know, with God <clears throat> desired, who desires all men to be saved. Yeah. We know that not all men will. See, and again, that's his, his preceptive will. Well, then, then now we're out here in this ta category. He desires all men to be saved. That says that they will not come to pass. Well, yeah. This means some will come to pass. Well, some will, but then the ones that will are in this category. There's ones okay. that don't are in this category. Okay. So it divides. All of that is still a part of the preceptive okay, will of gotcha, God. Gotcha. <clears throat> yes. Where does the Holy Spirit fit? Where does the Holy Spirit fit in? In the decision-making process is what you're well, talking about, right? Yeah, when you look at this and it's, you know, the creative will, perceptive will, moral will, choose whatever you want, or it's in God's word. I'm kind of reading ahead on the, mm -hmm. on the Bible. Where does the Holy Spirit lead? It, the Holy Spirit is directly, and we're going to see this a little bit later on. You're kind of going in front of us, but that's okay. It's a good question. It's a very legitimate one that always comes up in counseling, by the way. The Holy Spirit is directly related to the Word of God, okay? Now, how do we know that to be true? Well, grab your Bible just for a moment. Let's go over to Colossians 3, all right? <clears throat> go over to Colossians 3. Um, <clears throat> in verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Well, see, now the sister epistle, Ephesians 5.18, says the same thing, only rather than saying the word of God there, in Ephesians 5.18, if you look at the parallel reference to it, uh, here, same author, Paul is writing, uh, don't get drunk with wine, uh, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, Speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. So that's why I say the Spirit of God is directly tied to the will of God. So that you, you can't separate the preceptive will of God and the Spirit of God in terms of our moral decision making. And the Spirit of God is actively in terms of providence bringing about the sovereign decretive will of God. All right? At the same time. So they're intricately 
The Spirit is intricately involved in both of those processes. But I think when Christians ask the question that you ask, what they're really asking is, all right, isn't there another dimension that's kind of outside of this, all right, that enters in it? No. No. At that particular point, I think we're hedging close to that Deuteronomy 29, 29 thing, where we're basically using the Spirit as an excuse to try to know the future without... Um, uh, when, when in reality God has not given us the future. All right? That's what happens generically in the decision making process. All right, let's get started again. Um, we ended uh, in just before our break, and we were talking about the God's decretive will and God's perceptive will. There's only one other comment that I want to make about that is, is that it's amazing how many counselees get confused at this particular point. Um, and when you're able to sit down and you're able to describe this to them and even actually graphically represent it to them, maybe on a whiteboard or in some graphic way, maybe draw a picture on a piece of paper, how all the things, all of a sudden things become much clearer, uh, much more focused. And I think, um, this really is a great help to them. Now, Let's talk about how do you make decisions. And uh, we've got to establish some presuppositions in making a lot of these decisions, first of all. And you can see these in your notes. And I'm not going to make a lot of comments about them, but um, I'll, I'll may just make a few. Um, first of all, we do not need to know God's decreed will and how he's provi uh, providentially bringing it about before we make a decision. And see, that's that Deuteronomy 29, 29 issue. And when we, we start and we keep insisting on knowing that, we are basically um, trying to take over God's territory, something that belongs to him alone and not to us. What a God has already perceptively revealed belongs to us. So there's the first presupposition. The second one is the Holy Spirit's role is to convict, teach, and conform us um, all through the vehicle of the word of God. That's the Holy Spirit's role. In this thing. So as, as we come in contact with the word of God. As we saw the parallel in Ephesians 5.18. Colossians 3.16. As we come in. It is the Holy Spirit that works in us. To convict us. To teach us. Conform us. It is the spirit. Without the Holy Spirit. Our own souls would not naturally be responsive to that word. It's the Holy Spirit that instills belief. You know, and it's, it's, it's very similar. Um, grab your Bible for a moment. Let's go over to Hebrews chapter 2. Uh, excuse me. Hebrews 4. That's what I want. Hebrews chapter 4. And um, <clears throat> uh, in speaking of the, the people of Israel in the wilderness, um, it says in verse 2, For indeed, we have had the good news preached to us, just as they also... And the implication is that the good news here is a uang galizomai, which is uh, they were evangelized too. That's where we get our word evangelism. Good news preached them, the, peop the people of Israel in the wilderness, just as they also too. But the word, this is logos, uh, they heard did not profit them because it was not united by faith in those who heard. Now, why was that? Um, when, when, when you hear the word of God, and that word united is the word that actually means to mix. It wasn't mixed with faith. It wasn't, faith was not mixed up in it. When that doesn't happen, then, um, then it's of no profit to them. It's no profit to us. It's the Holy Spirit that helps to engender that faith as a proper response to the word of God. That's the Holy Spirit's role in this process. Um, this is just like Jesus prayed in the high priestly prayer. John 17, 17. Sanctify them by the truth. Thy word is truth. Okay. So. Uh, furthermore. See then. God only guides or leads his people today. And you'll notice this. By providence. Uh, and we only know that after the fact. Uh, which is a Proverbs 21, 1 issue. And by scripture. We can know that before the fact. That's Psalm 73, 24. We, we can know scripture before the fact. We can only know providence after the fact. So providence is always something that we gradually see unfolding 
uh, presently in our own lives. Furthermore, God is gracious God who has provided everything we need in order to do what he wants us to do. 2 Peter 1.3, we have everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him. That's what we need. E, then, God holds us fully responsible to search out and follow his preceptive will, or God's written word, in all of life. 2 Timothy 2.15, um, we're supposed to study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the world of, word of truth, or some of you have probably studied that in the Greek, cutting straight the word of truth is literally what the Greek means. So we have to cut it straight. We have to, so that it's, if you were a seamstress and um, you were cutting a piece of cloth and if you didn't cut it straight, it wouldn't match up to the pattern. Uh, so it would be all misshapen when you finally sewed it together. Uh, or if you were a carpenter and you were cutting boards for the floor of a house and you didn't cut them straight, the house is going to be misshapen. So in the same way, we've got to cut the word of God straight. And we're responsible for doing that in all of life, in our decision making. And probably, I would say 75% of bad decisions that Christian makes are a direct result of violation of 2 Timothy 2.15. They haven't cut the word of God straight. They've made decisions on what they think the word of God says, but they really haven't faithfully studied the word of God to see what it says. 75% of, of bad decisions among Christians are a violation of 2 Timothy 2.15. So this is critical. F, then if we make a decision based upon biblical commands and principles alone, we can fully trust that we are pleasing God in our decision and fully trust that he will providentially, by circumstances out of our control, change our choice if not within his decreed will. Um, you know, have you ever run into somebody or counseled them who they have, as best as possible, made all the right kind of decisions and yet they were still frustrated, ultimately, by the circumstances of our life and those decisions. Well then, your responsibility is to make all the right decisions and let the chips fall where they're gonna fall and God's in control of those chips. Um, but you've gotta just make the right decisions. Then the results are, are up to God. How God brings this about in his providential will is up to him. Then G, to rightly interpret and apply the word of God, we must use a prayerful, literal, historical, contextual, grammatical method of studying it. This is really critical, and this is what we want to touch on briefly because, as we said, 75% of all the bad decisions that Christian makes are made because of a violation of 2 Timothy 2.15. So this means how we understand the Word of God and what the Word of God says about our particular problem becomes a critical issue in terms of decision. So this brings us uh, to that issue uh, or to that Eventually, we're going to talk about what those different aspects mean. Literal, historical, grammatical, that kind of thing. Um, H, no one is ever outside of God's decreed plan. We, can saw that, we saw that in the chart that we had before. There's nothing that ever occurs in human history that God hasn't decreed. Um, even Satan has to ask permission of God before he makes any kind of move. Um, Furthermore, I, every believer needs pastoral oversight and the body of Christ in order to help him stay true to God's word. Every believer needs that. Now, why is that so? Well, take your Bible just for a moment and go over to Proverbs chapter 19. Proverbs chapter 19 and verse 27. Cease listening, my son, to discipline, and you will stray from the words of knowledge. Cease listening, my son, and you will stray. The implication is there is a natural wayward principle in every one of us that we, we can't stay neutral. We will eventually, like a ship without a mooring, drift away from the pier of God's truth. We'll naturally drift away. Okay? So we have to exercise self-discipline and we need pastoral oversight and the body of Christ to help us stay true. Contrary to what John Eldridge says in Wild at Heart, where all we need is just the Holy Spirit and run out there in the war woods with our clothes off in order to get in touch with our humanity and God, all right, away from the church and away from other people and away from the Word of God. And um, no, no, that's, that, that's not it at all. That's a, that's a sure way to stay in bondage to yourself and to your own passions. That's a, that's a sure recipe to do that. So... 
Furthermore, uh, the insistence of Jesus and the Old Testament writers was not on the importance of discovering the will of God, but always upon the necessity of doing it. Uh, it was as if they took for granted that we would know what we were to do. That's the revealed will. So the battle for us seems to be in the diligent study of his revealed will, the application of it, along with proper motivation. That seems to be the real big issue in decision making. All right? And yet, a lot of decision making manuals that are written uh, for Christians um, pay very little attention to this issue. Very little is said about uh, a diligent study of the revealed will and the application of it and a proper motivation in, in serving Christ in this way. So this is really a critical issue. Uh, the Bible must be our standard. Whenever we are confronted with a question about Christian practice, we must apply the teaching of the Bible. Sometimes the Bible will deal with it directly and we must go by its direct teaching. Often the Bible will not deal with it directly and then we must look for general principles to guide us. Uh, it does not matter what other people think. Their behavior is not a standard for us, but the Bible is a standard for us and it is by the Bible that we must live. Um, uh, and sometimes you'll get uh, members of your congregation or counselees who will say this, well, I know it was wrong for me to do that, but you know, I'm not as bad as so-and-so or this other person over here. I don't know. So now the standard for morality is the worst person on earth, right? Because, um, because everybody's always going to be able to find somebody worse than them until we get down to the worst person on earth. All right, so we keep going down this stairway of depravity all right, well, yeah, but there's somebody worse than I am, and they did something worse than this, and, and then there's, that person says, you know, so no, the standard for morality is not the worst person on earth. The standard for morality is God and his holiness and his revealed will. That's the standard for morality. So this is really critical. The Bible is the standard for us, and it's by the Bible that we must live. I like what J.C. Ryle says there in Walking with God. So that's the key. So what are these principles that are critical um, in terms of accurately interpreting the will of God? First of all, there's literal principle. What does that mean? That means interpreting the Bible in such a way that the historical events and miracles are taken seriously. Now, because of figures of speech and symbolic language, it would be better to refer to this as the literary meaning than literal meaning. In fact, I prefer that better. Uh, I don't like the term literal because it gives people the impression like we don't acknowledge that there is symbolic meaning in the Bible. Like for instance, uh, if your right hand offend you, cut it off. Is that literally speaking or is that symbolically and figuratively speaking? Well, some of the Alexandrian Jews who became Christians took that literally and literally chopped off their hands and plucked out their eyes. But we recognize that not to be, none of the disciples chopped off their hands. None of them plucked out their eyes. And besides that, that's within the context of lust. And we know that even a blind man can lust. We know that. A blind man can lust. So it's not a matter of whether or not you have physical eyeballs. Uh, that's not the issue. The issue is, Jesus is dealing with, you've got to cut off that which is most precious to you in your life if you're going to deal with lust. You've got to cut it off. What's most precious to you? Uh, because of these figures of speech, that's the reason why I like to refer to it as being a literary interpreter. Not so much a literal interpreter, but I understand that literal gives the idea of that we're taking the historical events, the miracles as actual uh, history uh, being unfolded there. And in that sense, I agree with it. But the whole point is... Um, we must interpret things on the basis of a literal principle in order to make right decisions. The second one is the historical principle. The best approach in properly understanding and applying the Bible is to ask the question, what did the original author intend these words to mean to the original audience? So interpreting the word with historical principle involves understanding the biblical writer, the biblical audience, and any historical cultural elements touched by the passage itself. All right. If you're really going to understand what the Bible meant, you've got to understand what it meant to the original audience. Then, by extension, you can understand what it means to you. By extension, you can see what it means to you. So the best approach 
here is asking the question, historically, what did the original author intend these words to mean to the original audience? How did, what did they mean? This is really critical. So interpreting the word of God involves um, understanding the biblical writer, uh, the audience, and the historical cultural elements touched by the passage itself. That's the historical principle. Um, how in the world are you going to really understand um, passages uh, like um, Ecclesiastes chapter 12 where Solomon is talking about uh, what it's like to grow old and he uses a lot of symbolic language the watchmen of the house tremble the mighty men stoop the grinding ones stand idle because there are a few he uses a sim lot of symbolic language but a lot of the symbolic language had direct reference to in, in that culture to different aspects of the body uh, the watchmen of the house had to do with the arms. The mighty men stoop had to do with the legs are weak. The grinding ones stand idle because they were few had to do with their teeth had fallen out because when they're old age. So they couldn't eat very well. Uh, if you understand that historically and culturally, then this passage makes a lot of sense to you. Uh, there in, um, in Ecclesiastes 12. So... That's, that's vitally important. That's part of the historical principle. Well, thirdly, not just that, but there's the grammatical principle as well. What is that? Well, the elements of grammar are the critical clues as to the intention and the meaning of the original author of the biblical text. So we're dealing with uh, elements of grammar. Uh, the grammatical principle means that faithful interpretation of the text involves a careful study and examination of the syntax, the parts of speech, the tenses, uh, the literary style, the genre of the biblical passage in question, all of that comes to bear grammatically on, on how we understand the preceptive will of God. Um, sometimes in getting at the tenses or the parts of speech of the original language, we're able to see things that are more obscure uh, in the English language or actually hidden by the English language. Sometimes the English language is vague in certain terms that are used. For instance, the, the English word you, Y-O-U, is a, well, you can't tell where that's singular or plural, but if you're using the Greek language, you can certainly tell whether it's singular or plural. It's very clear whether it is. But in the English language, it's not. So if you're able to get at uh, the original meaning of the language, you're able to pick up a lot of clues, better clues as to the actual meaning of the text. What is being referred to and what words agree with what words or um, uh, what words are uh, synonyms or antonyms, um, or what are antecedents. Um, all of this is part of the grammatical structure of the language that helps us to understand the original meaning of the text. Well, furthermore, there's the synthesis principle as well. This principle in inductive Bible study teaches that all the previous approaches, literal, historical, grammatical, are now carefully put together in order to arrive at a more full and complete understanding of the text. The ultimate goal of synthesis is to understand how the theological truths intersect with the life of the present reader and calls upon their life to change. How does that happen? How do those, how do those theological truths intersect the modern day reader so that change occurs? Um, this is part of um, getting to the application. How do these truths interchange? Or how do they intersect the life? The synthesis principle. Um, a 
arriving at these theological truths, then uh, some of those theological truths, once you've established them, you've got to be able to see them and how they applied to the original audience and how they can also apply to today. So they, in a sense, have to be timeless and, and not driven or limited by any cultural aspect. But they're theological truths that govern the ancient audience as well as the contemporary audience. In decision making, this is going to be critical. How they understand the scriptures and in, in interpreting them. Well, furthermore, then there's the practical principle. The crowning point of biblical interpretation and how the text must change the present reader. Uh, what is the practical meaning here? Uh, this is more than behavioral change. It involves change from the inside heart out. Uh, the heart must change. Real and lasting change has not occurred until the desires, cravings, intentions of the heart has changed through the repentance. Then behavior changes for all the right reasons. So the desires, the cravings, the intentions of the heart have to change through repentance. The heart, once the heart is changed, it will only be natural for the behavior to change. That's a very practical principle of the word of God. Accurately interpreting God's revealed will. All right. Now, with that said, um, that becomes now the standard by which we judge and make decisions is the word of God that sets the parameters on those decisions as we represented by that big light blue circle earlier. It sets the parameters of those. Now, what do we have to be cautious of? There's methods and motives that we need to be very, very aware of. And to be cautious of. What are they? Well, number one, misusing the Bible, obviously. That's the first thing. We've got it. Um, uh, oftentimes, people have a desire to proof text a passage. Or to kind of artificially engineer a meaning of a passage to fit their particular situation. That is misusing the scripture. Or um, personal advice. Um, a lot of Christians intend well, but if it's something that is, sounds good, but it isn't weighed and measured by what the scriptures say, then it very possibly could be very misleading. Even though your friend intends well, or someone else, the counselee's friend intends well, it can be misleading if it's not measured by what the word of God says. Um, we've got to be cautious of circumstances, results. Again, um, circumstances are not determiners of what is right and wrong. Circumstances are just the setting in which right and wrong things occur. Um, circumstances may be hard. In fact, oftentimes, taking the biblical route is actually the harder route at the beginning. Later on, it's the easier way of life, as Proverbs says. Taking the unbiblical route or the evil route is the easy way initially. But then later on, life gets hard. Um, you can't use circumstances and results to determine what's right. Or setting up conditions. All right. And I've seen a lot of Christians do this. They'll set up conditions. Well, if I'm going to, uh, there was a young lady who says, if I'm going to marry a particular young man, then he's going to have to be... Uh, uh, 25 years of age with the maturity of a 50 year old and he's going to have to really love the Lord and have his desire set on missions and he's going to have to want to go to the outer region of New Guinea um, in, in missions and he's going to need to be um, and he, she sets up all these conditions and then she says I know it's going to be the will of God well that limits almost all the Christian men on earth down to maybe one guy or two or maybe none. All right. 
Um, so all the possibilities of her now really getting married and having a God-honoring home is now totally removed as a result of her setting up artificial conditions upon who she's going to marry. Now, her having a burden for missionary work is not bad at all. But when it gets so specific like that, it can become almost a um, idolatrous thing where she wants her future husband to come into conformity with her plans rather than her being willing to come into conformity with his direction in life. That becomes a serious issue. All right, E, open and closed doors. As we said, open doors lead to elevator shafts. All right, just because those doors are open doesn't necessarily mean that that's God's will for a person's life. There are a lot of doors that are open out there in life, all right? Or reverse, if these closed doors are there, that means that that must, be not, that must not be God's will. No, it doesn't mean that. Maybe God wants you to work hard at getting that door open. That's God's will. Like I said, usually it's the biblical way that's the harder way initially. So we've got to be careful of that. Ideas, inner feelings, desires, impressions. This is what I call holy hunches. All right? And there are a lot of people who work. Well, you know, I just have this gut feeling. It's given me by the Holy Spirit. No, 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 no. It's not the Holy Spirit's giving you that gut feeling. It's whatever your inner feelings are that's giving you that inner feeling. And by the way, what's the criteria? How do you know the difference between the Holy Spirit and your own sinful desires? What's the criteria you know the difference between the two? That's pretty hard for them to do. Chuck? Where did the goosebump principle show up? Do you, do you know? Well, right. I know I've got this tingling finger, yeah. so that's got to be God's will. Yeah. Where, where does that where Wait, did it come from? You, you read a lot of medieval Roman Catholicism, and it's very goosebump oriented. Okay. All right. So I think a lot of that was, uh, occurred back during that particular time, bled over into the Protestant church uh, through a variety of means. And when Arminianism got started, a lot of it had to do with a, what a man thinks and how a man feels and that being taken as a leading of the Holy Spirit as well. So um, there's a lot of subjectivism and mysticism that's a part of the decision-making process um, that goes back, way back historically. <coughs> yeah. All right. It is. It is. And still, we're still fighting it today. Or an audible voice, all right, from heaven. Um, it's true. God can speak audibly. We're not, but we should expect God to do what he said he's going to do. And that is, as Hebrews 1, verses 1 and 2 says, he has spoken. The verb tense there speaks with finality through his son. He has spoken with finality. In other words, all the sum, to sum total of wisdom and knowledge is now communicated through his son, Jesus Christ. And all the gospels and epistles that are wrapped around him, that should be sufficient. Um, or misusing prayer. Um, and, and we do this when we begin to use prayer as a means to seek some kind of additional information from God and we're not content with the decision-making criteria he's given us in the word. Or inner peace. All right, Inner peace is not a guide for decision-making. It's the result of good decision-making. There's a difference. Inner peace is not the guide. It's the result of a right decision. That's, a di that's the difference. What's a good example of that? A good biblical example is Jonah, right? Uh, Jonah would very knew very clearly what God wanted him to do. Uh, he wanted him to go to Nineveh and preach to that city. And Nineveh were the arch enemies. The Ninevites were the arch enemies of Israel. That's the last thing that Jonah wanted to do. So Jonah goes down, hops a, a, a ship to Joppa, and he's so content going the opposite direction of God's will, he falls asleep. If there ever was a guy at pre peace, Jonah was at peace in the bottom of the ship. Inner peace is not a sign of decision making. All right? Oh, I must have made the right decision. Look at me. I'm so asleep. You know, it was doing the right thing that brought him a lot of angst and anxiety. That is, going to his enemy and having to preach to his enemy. Inner peace is not a sign that you're in God's will. Or certain devices that are used. Like, when I grew up, we used to have a little uh, plastic loaf of bread on our table with little 
cardboard verse cards in it called the Daily Bread. And we pull out a little verse card, and it was kind of like your spiritual fortune for the day. All right? And you'd read your little voice card, and you'd feel warm on the inside. Oh, you know, and you could almost feel the electricity coming from that little verse card. Of course, you don't have the foggiest idea what that means within the context of the flow of the passage. And so you just read this little isolated verse totally out of context, and you read into it any kind of meaning you want to read into it, and then you go off and, and you make decisions that day based upon that verse card, your spiritual fortune cookie for that day. All right? No. Those are little devices that are invented by man and little verses that are stuck on a daily calendar that suppose, oh, that must be what I need to do today. God is giving me a sign of what I need to do today. No, that's not it at all. I'll never forget Dr. Scott had a verse calendar and whoever had put it together at some publishing company put this verse on there and it was, um, it was actually something that Satan said to Jesus. <laughs> There in Matthew chapter 2 and during the temptation. And, and, and here this was on there like, a, uh, like a, a verse that was to be lived by for that day. All right. He can't, I'll never forget him coming into my office. He says, look at this. Look at this. You see what the verse on this thing says today? And that's like the spiritual fortune cookie type of approach. Or and there's signs. Well, there's lots of signs that can occur. When my, when my family and I were trying to make a decision on whether to leave the ministry and come here to Masters to teach, I remember taking my family out for ice cream and we were sitting at a, at a little picnic table and there was a great big umbrella there and they had it locked down with a padlock. And we were sitting there eating our ice cream and my one boy says, look dad, there's a sign because that padlock said Masters on it. <laughs> All right? There's a sign. And... And we looked at that and we go, whoa. <laughs> and my other son said, oh, dad, that's a sign that if we go out there, we'll get locked up. <laughs> so signs can be interpreted all different ways. That's not a criteria by which you make good decisions. Or there's dreams. Now, God chose to use dreams at different times throughout revelatory history in order to reveal his truth to man. But um, uh, dreams is not an authoritative way in order to receive information about decisions now. That doesn't mean that God can't do it. It's that if you begin to use that, you call into question the sufficiency of Scripture. Is the Scripture sufficient for our, the guidelines that we need? Does it have the guidelines that we need in order to... Um, to really make the right decisions. That seems like a, just a popular one too. I'm just, I've run across a lot of people that yeah, that draw a lot from dreams. Yeah. That's right. Or waiting on the Lord. You'll hear people talk about. Or you know their conscience. Well, the, the conscience can be a good guide if it's rightfully informed. If it's the right kind. If it's a good conscience, um, in terms of good decision making, or reason. Sometimes. Um, what God would have us to do in terms of moral action doesn't always seem the most reasonable thing to do. So it negates sometimes human reason or faith. I don't have enough faith enough to do this. This is what the disciples said in Luke 17 when Jesus says, if your brother offends you seven times in one day and comes back to you and asks you for forgiveness, uh, then forgive him. Uh, seven times in a day. And then immediately the disciple says, oh, Lord, increase our faith. All right. And Jesus says, it's not the amount of your faith that is at issue. He says, you can say this mulberry tree be uprooted and be thrown in the sea with just a little seed of faith. It's not the amount. It's what your faith is placed in. That's the issue. All right. Some people use faith. Other people use fasting. You know, well, if I fast and pray, if I understand the proper use of fasting, it's not for diets in the Bible and it's not for everyday decision making. It was when a person faced a life determining situation in their life, then prayer and fasting was a necessity. In fact, it's so life determining, you don't even feel like eating. You don't even feel like it. It's very obvious. This is a major determinative time in a person's life. You don't feel like eating at all. And then you fast and then you pray. 
Um, this is really a critical issue. Then the call. The call. What, whatever the call is, sometimes that can be a very mystical thing. People use that. Well, I just have this call. Or, um, you know, yeah, there's a small group of advisors that I have. And they, of course, they use that Matthew 18 passage where it talks about where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst, which really has to do with church discipline. doesn't have anything to do with personal decision making within the context. So all of these things are things that Christians will use and more in, in terms of um, that we have to be very, very cautious of. All right, then what are the biblical principles and subject, suggested method here? Number one, um, some of the prerequisites for biblical decision making, you've got to be rightly related to Christ. This is really key. And I'm going to go through these rather quickly because I think a lot of these pretty much are understandable and I want to emphasize something towards the end here. So you've got to be rightly related to Christ. You've got to be willing to pursue a life of worshiping God. If that's not happening, then you're not going to make godly decisions at all. Uh, you've got to recognize God's sovereignty overall. Uh, ultimately, this is where we said this is such a big part of the decision-making model, being willing to acknowledge that no, no matter what happens, God is sovereign in terms of the outcome of these decisions. Um, then there's some principles here. A scripture has bearing on all decisions one way or the other in terms of directive, motives, behavior, etc. Sometimes it has direct bearing on it. Sometimes it's indirect by theological principle. Wisdom. Now, when we are talking about wisdom here, we're talking about having moral discernment into the daily affairs of life. We're not talking about being incredibly smart. All right. We have a tendency in our modern culture to equate wisdom with smartness, where the Bible equates it with moral acuity and how, how to decipher things morally. You don't have to be really, really smart to be wise. And there are some very, very smart people who are incredibly foolish by biblical standards. Morally. Or there's purposeful freedom. Um, and, and, and what we're talking about there, and there are several passages that deal with this in Matthew 22, 37 through 40, Philippians 2, 1 through 5, um, 1 Corinthians 6, 12, and 10, 23 and 24, and Galatians chapter 5 and verse... Um, 13, we're dealing with um, uh, God has given us a freedom within the Christian life to always put obviously him first and others before ourselves in the decision making model. Uh, that's ultimately what's going to bring us the ultimate kind of freedom in life. Matthew 22, 37 through 40, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, on those two pegs, verse 40 says, the whole law hangs. How much you love God and how much you love other people. Everything in life goes back to that. Every counseling issue goes back to how much we love God and how much we love other people. Everything goes back to that. Um, uh, Galatians 5.13 is dealing with the whole issue of this is the, the, uh, the greatest commandment, the greatest Commandment in the law is to love your neighbor as yourself. So it has the other dimensions to it. Then there is desire. What are your personal desires in this issue? Um, as long as our desires are in line with God's desires, that becomes really critical here. Um, um, and of course, Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13 talks about the fact it's God who at work, who's at work in you both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. The will means to will his will after him. That should be our desire. Uh, our will has to be ultimately conformed to his will. That's critical. Then what we wish in life will become his wishes. That's all formative or that's all that informs our desires. So what's the process in decision making then? In making it, well... All of these interrelate. First of all, continually have a humble, yielded, and dependent will before God. That must be there all the time. Um, continually pray for wisdom. Um, in fact, as we mentioned earlier, First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17, we should continually uh, pray, or we pray without ceasing, uh, Paul says there. Gather all the factual data, uh, Proverbs 18, 13, uh, which basically says that, 
If a man speaks before he listens, he is a fool. So he says he's going to do something before he's really gotten gathered all the facts. He is the biggest fool of all. Study and any direct commands in scripture concerning this particular issue. This goes back to 2 Timothy 2.15 again. Make use of the Bible concordance, topical Bible, and other Bible reference books that will be able to help you in making that decision. And then study any indirect principles and statements in scripture concerning this particular issue. So are there things that indirectly apply to this? Then we've got to understand what they are and how they make an impact upon this decision. All of that is critical. Furthermore, weigh the purposeful use of freedom. Weigh it. All right, I have a certain freedom in my life, but I'm not going to let that freedom so be twisted, as Galatians 5.13 says, to, um, uh, to end up indulging my sinful nature. I'm not going to use my freedom to indulge my sinful nature. Is there anything wrong with this activity? Is it lawful? Uh, is it self-serving at the expense of someone else, uh, someone else's benefit is the idea. Uh, is this something I can thank God for? Such a critical issue. Is this something that I can thank God for? Or is this something that will glorify God? As um, 1 Corinthians 10, 20, um, 10 30 says. Um, 1031 says, I said, and 2 Timothy or 2 Corinthians 5 9. Is this worth imitating as well? Uh, can others imitate me? And I feel confident that that's a worthy thing to be imitated. Is this following the example of Christ? Um, will my choice affect others around me? If so, in what ways? Is it beneficial? Does it promote any spiritual life? Or does it promote my spiritual life? Uh, is it a practice that over time will tend to master me? Will it stimulate a desire that will be difficult to control in me? These are questions that I need to ask myself. Is it constructive? Will it promote the spiritual well-being of other believers if they engage in this practice that is permissible for me? Um, of course, Jerry Bridges, um, uh, this comes out of Jerry Bridges' uh, Disciplines of Grace on page uh, 213. So all of these are really key issues. Um, here. Um, furthermore, affirm that your desires are God honoring. Affirm that your desires are God honoring. Um, what it, do I want to do and will it bring glory to God before you make this decision? Uh, this is an occasion where my flesh or sinfulness is seeking to indulge itself. If that's the case, then I don't want to do it. Um, if you still can't decide at this particular point, then Romans 14, 13. In other words, something that's not done in faith then becomes what? Sin, right? If you can't do it in faith, then it's sinful for you. Um, I'll never forget having a young man come into my office and he's been dating this young lady for a, a period of time and he's trying to decide whether or not he should marry her, but he has a lot of doubts in his mind and I eventually said to him, you know what? I'm gonna change his name, uh, call him Jack. You know what, Jack? Um, if you married her, it would be a sin. <gasps> Why? Is there something wrong with her? No, it's not something wrong with her. It's something wrong with you. So what's that? Because you have so many doubts in your mind that if you married her, you wouldn't be doing it in faith. Then it's going to become sin for you. Don't marry her if there's that many doubts. No, uh, this is what we call the holding principle. If it involves the conscience and you're unsure about it, then rather than taking the risk of sinning, don't do it. And then gather more data and start over. All oh, that's key. Gather more data and then start over. Well, I'm afraid at this particular point, they'll probably need to pick up next week with the whole issue of... Um, well, let me summarize this real quickly, and then we'll, we'll talk about the case studies. Um, summary of some of these guidelines. Number one, in situations where the Bible directly addresses your decision, it is to, it is to be obeyed. It's to be obeyed. Secondly, in situations where there is no direct or indirect principle or command, you are free and responsible to choose your behavior. Just don't indulge the flesh in doing so with your freedom, as Galatians 5.13 says. 
in situations that have no bearing on biblical morality, then you're, you're responsible to make wise decisions. Situations that have no bearing on biblical morality, you're responsible to make wise decisions. And then in all situations, you are to humbly submit in advance to God's sovereign will as it affects each of your decisions. Now those are just summary guidelines to help someone you're counseling in terms of the decision-making process. To help them think through it. 